The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. It is state fair time once again in Nebraska, and this is a very special one. It's the 150th Nebraska State Fair, and there are lots of very special things planned. Here today to talk about it from Swanson Russell is Mike Losey. He is in charge of the team helping promote and market the Nebraska State Fair. You don't want to miss it. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake. You know what this is? Of course you do. It's a runza. The interesting thing is that we're going to talk about the runza, which came to Lincoln in the 1940s with the Germans from Russia. Fascinating story with Sherry Pavelka, the executive director of the Germans from Russia Museum. Please stay tuned. I'm Sam Truax, and today my guest on Live and Learn will be Jane Nelson, who is going to tell us about stitching. So the first thing you can do is learn from this program all about stitching, and then you can live by joining a stitching group. Funeral or end of life planning is a delicate subject, whether it be for a loved one or pre-planning for yourself. I'm Kristen Stowes. Please stay tuned to hear from Dean Schneider of Roper & Sons on this tender topic. It might be the gentle nudge you need to think about this important subject in your own life. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Every August, under Midwestern sunlight, small town pride forms an entire city, and the midway running through it becomes the main street of an entire state. It collects the smells of soft dirt and sweet sugar, the banter of storytellers and livestock and live music, the beaming smiles and glow of overhead lights. It's time to celebrate the pride that never grows old, the work that never stops, the things we've always done that make us a little different. It's time for hundreds of thousands to pilgrimage across the prairie to exchange hellos. Because 11 days a year, every year, there is no place in Nebraska that feels quite this Nebraskan. It's time to pin on the ribbons, pass the traditions, and pass the mustard. It's time to shine. Once again, it's time for the Nebraska State Fair. Hello everyone and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. And this year, it's a very special Nebraska State Fair. It is the 150th anniversary, and might as time fly, it's the 10th year that it has been in Grand Island. We are gonna talk about the State Fair today. Always a great place. You can get great information, lots of good information. There is wonderful entertainment, all kinds of things to see and this year is going to be no exception. We have a very special guest to join us today to talk about the Nebraska State Fair and all the things that are going to be happening and taking place. His name is Mike Losey. He is from Swanson Russell and he is in charge of marketing the Nebraska State Fair. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Jerry. Pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this whole process, because I think this is your second year. Yes, this is our agency's second year on working with Nebraska State Fair. And uh, in 2018, uh, Nebraska State Fair hired a new executive director in Lori Cox. And one of her initial uh, initiatives was to bring on a marketing partner. And so Swanson Russell uh, went through a, a competitive process and an RFP process, and we were very excited to be the agency that was selected to work with Nebraska State Fair. And Lori is fabulous to work with. I, I think this is her second year as well of being yes. involved. And she's got lots of great ideas. She's, she's definitely an innovator in the, in the, in the industry, um, very exciting to work with. The 11 days of the fair, there are over 1,100 events going on. And so wow. it's going to be very challenging from a marketing standpoint, very fun, as you kind of imagine working with a client like this, but it's definitely a team effort. Uh, we've got copywriters, we've got uh, designers, we've got a social media team that works on Nebraska State Fair, and of course the digital team as well. 
So it's a team effort, but we love it because we take a lot of pride in working with one of Nebraska's oldest brands and certainly one of their most iconic brands as well. Let's talk about the fact that it's the 150th year. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think that is, it is incredible. Um, and you've even created a new word for yes. it, so we need to talk about that. And, and tell us about some of the uh, exciting things that you have um, set up for this um, celebration. Certainly. Well, this is the 150th Fairabration, and that's the word we came up with because it's more than an anniversary, it's more than a celebration, it's more than a birthday. It's a combination of so many different things. And so we thought, Fairabration, that sounds like it has a nice ring to it. And so along with that, you can imagine there's a lot of unique events and activities that are going on. And we've got everything from firework celebrations at the beginning and towards the end of the fair, and all kinds of competitions that are tied in with the 150th theme. There's a photography contest, there's textiles and fine arts contests going on. There's also a cupcake decorating contest that kids can participate and they're gonna line up 150, 150 uh, cupcakes and they're gonna start decorating on that. So, so I, don't, I can't do that. <laughs> there's a cake eating contest oh, as okay. well if you, if you wanna get involved oh, in that. that. Sounds you can much certainly do like that, Jerry, speed, yes. Yeah. <laughs> What about some of the new things? It's, it's always fun um, to go to the fair every yeah. year because there's always something new and I know that there are some new things um, that are going to be planned as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, amongst some of the new things that they're doing this year is they have a rough stock rodeo going on and they also have a polo match. And so I don't know how many people from Nebraska have ever seen a polo match. I haven't, but I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, another thing that's going to be exciting to see, and I love it, the Cornhusker Marching Band. Oh, yeah. It's also their 150th anniversary as well, and so we're going to get these two iconic brands together and help celebrate. So that's going to be pretty exciting. And I understand there's a new opening uh, that people will see when they come in? Yeah, there's a very grand entrance at the uh, entryway of Nebraska State Fair, and our agency was very involved in creating that, and so I don't want to spoil the uh, surprise on it, but I look forward to having everybody experience that new uh, gateway. Very good. Okay, uh, one, of the, one of the things and the, that I think our audience is very interested in um, is the older Nebraskans oh, yeah. day. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. There are really a, uh, a couple of things that are, that are going on that I think that we ought to mm -hmm. talk about. And, and one of those um, is just the fact that older Nebraskans are a very integral part of the yes. state fair, uh, not just as, as coming out as patrons, but mm -hmm. also as volunteers. Oh, a absolutely. I don't really don't think that Nebraska State Fair could exist without the volunteers and especially the senior volunteers. Um, I learned from uh, the team at Nebraska State Fair that they have over a thousand volunteers. Wow. And so there's no way that this event can go on without those volunteers. And so it's a very important integral part of it. And I think that's one of the reasons also we turn around and celebrate older Nebraskans at this event every year. Yeah, it's, it's a group that has a real history oh, yes. uh, of, of coming out year after year. Lots of them probably came out when it was in Lincoln. Now they go out yes. to Grand Island and, yeah. and see all the new things. So um, uh, I, I think it's great that there is, there is a day that sort of celebrates mm -hmm. uh, older Nebraskans uh, in the state. And now that I am one of them, I'm glad to be celebrated. Well, in, in addition to all kinds of entertainment and activities, certainly there's the wellness um, activities yeah. going on as well. And I think that's just as important and can be just as fun as any of the other activities going on at the fair. Yeah, it's very important and valuable. We're gonna, we're gonna sort of walk through at least a few uh, of some of the exhibitors that mm -hmm. are going to be there. Um, it's a great place to get information. Um, you see that there's the Grand Island Area mm -hmm. Clean Community System Legal Aid of Nebraska. If you have some sort of questions right. concerning any, uh, any legal issues, um, the Midland Area Agency of Aging, uh, people get questions uh, about those kinds of things. If you want to get your hearing tested, yeah. get your blood pressure tested, yes. uh, all kinds of really um, good places uh, that, that we can take advantage of. Well, and I think it's all about kind of uh, informing yourself, empowering yourself, and being proactive with your health. Oh, very good. Okay, so it would not be complete without the entertainment, right? Oh, yes. And we have, uh, we have quite the entertainment here because I, I sort of feel I need to, uh, to read some of this stuff because it's very uh, interesting. It is going to be the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame legends, the Drifters, Cornell Gunther's Coasters, and the Platters. They take the show, uh, you see a picture of them all. One, one show, it is at 11 a.m. And if mm -hmm. you just go down this list uh, of songs, um, Under the Boardwalk, Stand yeah. By Me, uh, Magic Moment, Save the Last Dance for Me, Charlie Brown, The Great Pretender, oh. we could probably bust into, 
I could probably bust into a lot of these songs. I'll join in. Next. Why not, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this should be a great show, yeah. right? No, I think no matter your age, those songs resonate with everybody. They're iconic songs and unbelievable talent. Uh, very fortunate to have them at Nebraska State Fair. And it's a nice price. I mean, it's 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 sort of inexpensive to, to yes. be able to do this show. And it's usually a pretty full house. Oh, absolutely. So it's uh, enjoyed by everybody. Now, uh, one of the things that I also find very interesting, and, and if you want to take credit for it, or if you want to give it to somebody else, that's fine. But this year, um, the ticket price yes. for anybody who is 60 or older has dropped. I mean, it is only five yeah. bucks, right? Yes. I mean, that is an incredible deal all throughout the state fair. It's, and it's $5 any day of the fair. And so it doesn't matter if it's the weekends or during the week, whenever you want to go. And, and that credit goes to Lori Cox and her team. Um, she understands how important it is to uh, older Nebraskans and those 60 plus and wants to make sure that uh, we make that invitation loud and clear that we really want you to attend the fair. Very good. Okay, so uh, there's more entertainment than just on Older Nebraska oh, yeah. Day, right? So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the entertainment. I know lots of folks who are uh, in their 60s who will love lots of these uh, other acts. So we've got uh, Red Dirt Country Concert Series, and there, there you get to see the names of some of the bands mm -hmm. that are, that are going to be appearing. Yeah, absolutely. They've done a great job of getting a variety of different types of music acts, everything from the Red Dirt, which is really hot right now, to, mm -hmm. to Hot Country, to, of course, rock bands as well. Right. So here are the, here are the rock groups. Um, uh, I know these are some of your favorites. Uh, Theory of a Dead Man, Bad mm -hmm. Wolves, and Hailstorm. Uh, you've probably got all these on your playlist. In I, your, on your I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we have some really great country acts as well. Uh, um, uh, Brad Eldridge, uh, Marin Morris, and of course a little big town. Yeah, great acts. Uh, also going to be there. So there's lots of really great entertainment. Yeah. All the shows are at 8 o'clock, right, except for the one show, which is uh, 11 in the morning. Yes, that's exactly true. Yeah. And a great venue, so we, we encourage folks to, mm -hmm. uh, to take advantage of some of that. Let's talk about, there's one more act that we uh, yeah. do want to talk about. Um, uh, and that's going to be on Veterans Day, right? Yes, so celebrating on September 2nd, we're saluting the veterans, and this is such a great event, and I'm very excited that Trace Atkins is gonna be the lead performer on that. And uh, many people know Trace Atkins for his big support of the Wounded Warriors mm -hmm. program, and so in addition to having all types of celebrations and, and tributes to veterans on that day, you get to kick it off with Trace Atkins. And, it's only ten dollars, and that gets you in the wow. that gets you in the gate as well. So make a whole day of it. What a great opportunity to see a great talent and salute our veterans. Yeah, that's a wonderful yeah. that's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we run out of time, let's talk about the food because oh, I yes. think uh, you can't go to the state fair, you can't talk about the state fair without thinking about the food. Oh, yeah. And um, you've got some great vendors going to be out there and some real interesting yes. kinds of food, right? Oh, absolutely. I think you're always going to have the st old standbys, anything that you can deep fat fry and put on a stick. Of course. And so the corn, the, from the corn dogs to the funnel cakes, the, the giant turkey legs will certainly be there, but they're always adding great innovative new foods to the fair. And uh, we've had gourmet mac and cheese. Uh, they're going to have Hawaiian tacos, gelato, uh, some European foods as well. Oh and then, of course, there's, there's uh, classic candies at the fair as well. Right. I had a, a, f a friend who had the donut hamburger uh, one time. I was gonna, told you I was going <laughs> to ask you this. Tell me that. Tell me the strangest thing you've had out at the state fair. Um, not just the strangest, but one of my favorite is the, the fried Oreos. Oh, fried Oreos. Yeah, definitely love those. Okay, those are probably low in, in calorie content. Calories don't and sugar. count. Yeah, calories don't, calories count, don't at the count, fair. count at the state fair. That's right. Okay, very good. Well, it's going to be a, a great time. Uh, it is um, August 23rd through September 2nd. Those are the dates. Um, if you want more information, uh, we have a website. Uh, it's a great website. You've helped redesign yes. this. Yes. So if you need any information, if you need directions, if you need more information about Absolutely. the acts, it's, it's all up there. Of a full schedule of events and all the information that you need to have a great time at the Nebraska State Fair. Fabulous. Mike, thank you so much Thanks, uh, for coming by and, and uh, talking to us about the State Fair. I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. And thank all of you for uh, tuning in today to Live and Learn. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. We'll take you out today with some more shots of previous state fairs.
vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and welcome. <laughs> Did I say that right? Pretty good. Oh. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. You know yes. what that means? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, so. we're going to talk today about something very, very special. Uh, the Germans from Russia, and of course we have that that beautiful facility right here in Lincoln, yes. and Cherry Powelko is executive director, and we're going to have a wonderful story about this, and we're going to eat some runzas, uh, which I love them. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Okay, now the story of the Germans from Russia is fascinating. Mm -hmm. What happened? Why did the Germans go to Russia in the first place? Well, it all started with Catherine the Great. Mm -hmm. She was a German princess, and she was um, married into the Russian royal family. And so in 1762, wow. the man that was her husband his, was named Peter III. But Peter III was not a good ruler. And he liked to play with little toy soldiers. And what happened was she and her friends had a coup and overthrew him. Uh -huh. And so uh, she became the empress. And in 1762, she invited people to come to Russia to settle and to be in the west, in the eastern part of her empire. Mm -hmm. And so, and and therefore they wouldn't have to uh, go go to war. I understand. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. that's really an important thing, Lita. Uh -huh. uh, she issued an, a, another invitation in 1763 because the first one didn't get many people to come. But in the second one, she said that they would not have to. Um, have any taxes, they could live where they wanted to, they could govern themselves, but the most important thing was that the men would not have to serve in the Russian uh -huh. army. And so she guaranteed them that, and she said it would be forever. And so that was very appealing, because it was just at the end of the Seven Years' War. Well then, so why did they, the Germans leave Russia and wind up coming to the United States? Well, that's an interesting part of the story too, because her great-grandson became the uh, Tsar of Russia, and he reneged on all those promises. He said that instead of being forever, it was 100 years. You know, she meant 100 years. Uh -huh. And so he said that they would have to serve in the army. And yeah. that was a, a huge um, reneging of her promises. And so they decided to move. And that was in about 1880 that right. the, the Germans from Russia were now uh -huh. going to wind up coming you know, to the United States, right. which is really fascinating. I'm yeah. so glad that uh -huh. they're here. <laughs> OK, well, why was Lincoln the settlement where a lot of the Germans from Russia came right here to Lincoln. Well, Lincoln was very important because Lincoln was a railroad hub. Uh -huh. And one of the things that the railroad needed to do at this time, it was putting track down. And they needed to sell land along the track. So they all got here on the train. They did, they came on the train. And often the men would get a job with the railroad. Mm -hmm. They got to, uh, that was their employer. And so the railroad was very important for them. and. Uh, critically important fact, they had an immigrant house where they could stay until they got on their feet. Mm -hmm. And it was all with the railroad. Well, back in, in the early days of the 20th century, mm -hmm. how, how many of the Lincoln population actually came from Russia? I think this is something not many people know, but at the early 20th century, a third of Lincoln and I Lancaster County were German-Russian descent. I had no idea. Yeah, One it's pretty third amazing. of the population in the 1940s of Lincoln yeah. were from Germans from Russia. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad that they came here. And how did they get here? It, on the, was it everybody on the train? Well, they did come on the train. Yeah. Most of them came on the train. And they came in from different ports. They were all over Canada, New Orleans, all over. But they did come mostly in on the train. Well, then when they came to Lincoln, mm -hmm. why did they call it the Russian Bottoms? I mean, why? Okay, well, you know, when they first came, they were very poor because they were not able to bring 
um, really hardly anything with them on the ship and they didn't have much to, to bring. And so they settled in the areas that were not very desirable. They were the areas around the north, uh, the oh. north bottoms is around the stadium, ah, the south bottoms is up by Cooper Park or F, F Street Park is what it used to be called. But they were cheap land. And so they were bottoms, they were close to Salt Creek and ah. they often flooded. And so that made oh. them undesirable in some other ways because of that. Oh, well, why did we call them the dirty Russians? Yeah, that's something that is, is known. They did, you know, like many um, immigrant groups, when they come, people are meeting them with skepticism and even some hostility sometimes. And so they saw these people, they were German, but they looked different than the regular Germans from Germany. They looked more like Russians, and so they mm. were um, skeptical about them. And they called them dirty, which was absolutely ridiculous because those little German ladies, they would not only scrub their porches and their, you know, their houses, they'd scrub the sidewalks and street <laughs> and, uh, you know, sweep the streets. So it was really very much a misnomer. It's not, not any way nearly what they were. Well, then I'm so glad that you have a museum now mm -hmm. to capture all of this history. Right. We want to learn about that museum and yeah. so forth. Um, and see where it where it is where okay. it actually is. All right, we're located at 631D Street, mm -hmm. and I mentioned Cooper Park before. We're right across the street from Cooper Park, mm -hmm. and so if you know where that's at, you'd be able to find it very easily. Okay, now when we come, what are we going to see? Oh, museum. when you come, you're going to see an amazing thing because we have, not only do we have a museum inside our headquarters, we have an entire campus where we have outbuildings. We have a summer kitchen, we have a chapel, we have a general store, and we have an agricultural building that has a blacksmith shop and um, an agriculture area. And the final thing that we have is a cow barn. And inside that cow barn is Katie the Coo. And Katie is... <laughs> Katie the Coo cow? Yeah, Katie the cow. <laughs> and you know, Lita, she's pretty much a celebrity. Oh, she Because is. she's been in Midwest Living and, you know, been featured in lots of local uh, publications. And she's much more famous than any of us are at the <laughs> headquarters. So she's pretty fun. She was a gift from one of our chapters. So. Well, of course, this is all about the Runza. <laughs> oh, sure, Runza's. We're okay, famous for Runza's. Okay, okay. All right, I got to know the history of this. How did this come about, the Runza? Okay, well, in Russia, they were called Runza's as well. They were also called Biroks. They were called um, Kraut Kuga, which is a, another term for kraut, like cabbage. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Kuk and cake. And they would take these, and they would take them out to the fields with them and they were portable and they could keep them and they could have their lunches out in the fields and they would be right there and it was a very versatile food for them. Well, the, the, fact, uh, the fact that the meat is inside and right. it's covered, you, you could probably be out in the field and it still, it wouldn't um, deteriorate. Exactly, you know? it would be fine. It would be good and then it would, could be kept out, out, out there and it was, it was uh, you know, something that they ate all the time. Now, some of them were all onion, some were all cabbage, some were cabbage and onion or different vegetables. But the most popular one is what we have here, you know, the cabbage and onion and, and um, <coughs> ground beef. Excuse what, me. What, where did the, what, what, <coughs> is, what is the name Runza? What, what does that actually mean? Um, well, Runza is just a term that they would have used over there. Well, so what, it, what, it stands for a sandwich or? or yeah, it's a sandwich. It's, you, you've got it in your hand. That's all that I know. <laughs> that's as much as I know. Pretty soon it's going to be in my mouth. Well, there you go. Because <laughs> she was very generous and brought some for us today yeah. for, to really taste it. Okay, now uh, I, want, I want you to get a pen or a pencil and write this down because if you have not been to the museum, you've missed something very special. And it's located right here in Lincoln. Uh, it's the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia, and the address is 631 D Street, and uh, they're open Monday through Friday, 9 in the morning until uh, 4 p.m. Now, they're not clo they're, you're closed on the weekends, Correct. right? Correct. So if mm -hmm. you have any questions, you'll want to call 402-474-3000. 
3363. Right, and we do have a website, yeah. and that's www.ahsgr.org. Okay. And so they can learn a lot about us there as well. And as you come, as you come there, as you're driving down the street, you'll, mm -hmm. see, you'll, you'll see it because the serving hands, right. uh, the, those new productions, mm -hmm. will, are really out there. And it, it's, it's fascinating it to is. see it. It is. Yeah, we have one at our uh, location, and we love it. It's great. What have we not <coughs> said that you would like to ha have our viewers know today? Well, I just think it would be important for your viewers to know the impact that the Germans from Russia made on Lincoln, because they really did make a profound impact. We have in the people that you would be able to say are German-Russian descent, we have mayors, we have regents, we have doctors, lawyers, teachers, we have every kind of uh, craftsman that you can imagine all areas of expertise and of different jobs. And, you know, I think it's really um, important for us to remember that. And then the second thing is to really come down and see us, because I think sometimes we're just a little bit of a gem that not many people um, realize. And so I thank you for this opportunity to come and talk about us and to talk about our headquarters and to let people know where we're at and what we're all about. Well, Sherry Pavelko, you've done a wonderful job and charge of, in charge of that great museum. And we encourage everybody to come mm -hmm. over. It, it's really a fascinating place. And there might even be a run <laughs> around somewhere. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Never know. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we want you to, <laughs> to be reminded that it's never too late to live and learn more about the Runza. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. I'm Sam Truax, and today on Live and Learn, my guest is Jane Nelson of Valhalla Lace and Honey, who's going to tell us about stitching. Jane, tell us what stitching really is. Good morning, Sam. Um, stitching is defined by the Embroiderers Guild of America as creating on fabric using a needle and thread. The Smockers Group defines needlework stitching as creating a design or a picture on fabric that has been pleated by the means of a pleater and then you you create you stitch on top of the pleats and so you do a lot of dresses um, some ornaments things like that smocking as is one I have not heard of it sounds kind of dangerous though but Smocking is smocking, I guess. Yes. <laughs> How are you involved in uh, this needlework? Currently, I'm a member of the Lincoln Needleworkers Guild, the Prairie Bell Smockers Group, and the Lincoln Lace Makers. And the needlework is under a national group, I understand. Yes, the Needlework Guild is a chapter of the Embroiderers Guild of America. I see. So you're not the only one that does this stuff, are you? No, I'm no. not. There are many, <laughs> many, many people that do it. So involvement in stitching is probably as much social as it is a craft, do you think? Or? Oh, it can be very social. Um, all three of the groups, the Lace Makers, the Smockers, and the Needlework Guild, have um, national conventions, regional conventions, uh, where you go and take classes and you learn more about the things that you enjoy doing. Um, individually in uh, communities, if you have a guild, then you have meetings, you have business yeah. meetings, you have social meetings, um, you, you have gatherings. You kind of promote a, a potluck quarterly or something like that, don't you? I, we do do a potluck quite yeah. frequently, uh, yeah. and so there's always food involved when the stitchers like to get together. <laughs> so mm, I might have to join myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had the, quilters, the quilting museum people here, and they basically said, 
some of the people wouldn't even be quilters if it weren't for the social aspect. Is that kind of the way it is with, with the needlework crafts? I would say that that's, that's kind of how they are as well. Um, if you're concentrating on a very challenging project, you might prefer to do that at home where it's a little more quiet, but um, there are lots of things that you can do that um, don't require as much concentration so you can just really visit well, as with everybody. As you can see on, this, on the monitor, we have some pictures of the people in these get-togethers. So they're, some of them are sewn, they're not even eating. <laughs> Most of these pictures that I have today are, are, are sorry, just, not yeah, eating. They're, yeah. they're still in the serious mode. <laughs> Can you explain or show us the difference between the crocheting and cross stitch and the different types of stitching that happens? Cross stitch would be done with a needle and thread on fabric and you generally have a chart that you follow to know where to put your stitches. Yeah, that's Crocheting is usually done with a hook and um, yarn, there generally you go. yarn, Great. generally not a very fine fabric. Knitting is done with needles as opposed to one single hook. You can knit with two needles. You can also knit with four needles and that's generally again with yarn. But you can do knitted lace with a much finer fiber uh, than yarn. And, and we have embroidery and tatting. Too. Embroidery is, I find that a lot of the people that I hang out with to do these things, um, they all, the first thing they learned was embroidery. And that is one thing that I've not had much experience with. I see. I can talk about it and I can show a little bit of it, but uh -huh. I don't, it's not, I'm not proficient at it like some are. Actually, the difference between cross stitching, cross stitching, you have a pattern, but in embroidering, you're kind of sewing that pattern right into the fabric. Or right, something it could like be that. done very, yeah. very free form, yes. Uh, and, and we have tatting too, how about that? What's your experience there? Tatting is done with a shuttle and you can use fibers that are very thin or heavier. You can tat with yarn. Tatting is something that's very easy to carry with you. All you need is a ball uh -huh. of thread and a shuttle and you can put it in your pocket and you can sit in the doctor's waiting office and work on it or do it in the car while you're traveling. Well, that's not the only type of lace either, I believe, right? That's there is bobbin lace. Do you have to do that with a sewing machine or is that why they call it a bobbin? Um, I'm not sure where the word bobbin fits I in see. there, but bobbin lace is done with, um, well, I guess you could call them bobbins. Uh, you have oh, one I bobbin see. for every thread that is uh, needed in your, um, the work that you're going mm -hmm. to do. And you have to do it on a large pillow. Your pattern is, is pinned to the pillow. I and see. you work the pattern, oh, I see. work your threads over the top of that pattern. So it's a little more, um, it's a lot like weaving. You're not tying knots. Um, and it's not portable. You're not generally going to so, take it with you when you go. So that exists, but how many people do, what, what, what would you say the most popular one is of all those, the crocheting or the cross stitch? Or Knitting has reached knitting, um, huh? quite a bit of a resurgence recently. Um, I would say the cross stitch is still um, very popular. The tatting and the bobbin lace, um, tatting would be more popular than the bobbin lace. You don't find, it's yeah. expensive to get into, so people uh, sometimes I are not see. willing to invest that kind of money into yeah. something they don't know if they're gonna like it. With all, with all this, the skull caps that the young people are wearing these days, you'd think knitting, they'd be knitting their the, own hats. They you should know? be knitting they their own. They should get more Absolutely. involved in this, in this stuff. They should. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, we also have sh smocking. Smocking, yes. Smocking. Smocking. Um, I'm a beginner at smocking. I thoroughly enjoy it. It's not terribly difficult to do. Um, I'm not. I like to do small things. I like to work on ornaments. Um, 
I'm not into making dresses and clothing, uh -huh. um, but I enjoy the smocking. It really is a lot of fun. Yeah, my, my granddaughter makes little doilies for like coasters, mm -hmm. which is crocheting. Crocheting, yes. yes. So if she put all those together, I mean, it would be a bread spread, but instead I've got a stack of them at the, at the house, at that. <laughs> but there are some, are there some notable occurrences that, that really happened? Well, well, let's see. We're gonna, we're gonna get a little close one more time here. Both the lace part and the honey part of Valhalla lace and honey are kind of long time crafts. Is that because you're trying to preserve some of those old crafts? Or well, is there the, some other reason you got involved in it? I originally started with knitting when my great aunt taught me how to knit little squares for blankets that she sent to China as she had been a missionary there. Uh -huh. um, and so my, my interest developed um, over a period of years. I used to live in Omaha and I used to quite frequently go to Lee Ward's and Mangelson's and I took many, many classes and learned lots of different fiber art projects. Um, and so you just kind of have that desire to continue to learn more and more and um, we need to teach our young people to do those things or they will become lost. So the pe yes, exactly. That's, that, that's the good part about it. Some of those crafts, people lose interest in them. Yes. How, are, how many young folks or men do you think are involved in this? Well, I, I like, do know men who do um, bobbin lace, tatting, hmm. crocheting. Um, the young people, sometimes it's harder to get to them because they're so busy in school and, and athletics and that type of thing. But uh, there are 4-H groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Southeast Community College. Um, in the homeschool community, there are ladies who work with homeschool students. Um, mm -hmm. So there are people who are, are focusing on on the young people. Continuing, yes. yeah, con yeah, and continuing to get them interested. I'm right. surprised that Southeast Community College has classes like this. They huh? do. Wow. Yep, they, they do. got classes on everything there. <laughs> what kind of a proportion do you think it is, man? You think it's they have as much as 10% of the group or I'm going to say it could be less than 10%. Less than 10%. Um, although I do know two brothers that live in Colorado that teach tatting and they travel all over the United States yeah. and um, they're, they're amazing well, tatters and lots of fun. So when you have a local, a, a local potluck, for example, you get people from Omaha and probably surrounding areas. It's I not do. all from Lincoln, is I it? I do. I even have a lady that will travel usually from Sioux City. Wow. To come down. See, so. there is, there's a lot of interest there. Yeah. If, once you get involved, you really get obsessive about it, you it do. sounds like. You huh? do. <laughs> well, I usually tell my viewers after the interviews that uh, they need to get involved in this. And the way you get involved in this case is to go to a stitching group and see what's going on and see how well you'd like it. I'd like to thank my guest, Jane Nelson of Valhalla Lace and Honey for telling us about stitching. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Legal services are a part of the spectrum of senior services available through our eight area agencies on aging. Attorneys can assist and educate seniors on consumer credit and debt collection issues, as well as help them plan ahead with advanced directives. Attorneys can also help seniors with consumer fraud and financial exploitation concerns and also guide them through government benefit issues. For more information, contact the Elder Access Line at 800-527-7249. Funeral planning and end-of-life services have evolved over the years. I'm Kristen Stowes and I'm pleased to welcome Funeral Director Dean Schneider, who will tell us what to think about in funeral planning today. Welcome to Live and Learn, Dean. Good morning, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to have you here. I always like to start by hearing about my guest's background. Could you please tell us about yours? Sure. I grew up in uh, O'Neill, Nebraska, a little town outside of O'Neill called Inman on a, a cattle ranch. So okay. I grew up 
riding horses and <laughs> getting chased by cows and <laughs> working cattle and cattle ranch, those kinds of different opportunities. Okay, and then you came to the University of Nebraska. I did, I went to the University of Nebraska. I was able to uh, play football for Coach Osborne and, and had a wonderful experience with him and, and got to know a lot of really unique individual, very special people uh, as part of the university and a lot of teammates that were uh, part of the program when I was there. Okay. Very interesting time. People always ask, would you do it again? Because it's, it's a very grueling schedule. It's uh, pretty demanding on your time and on your body. Yeah. And now that I'm approaching 50, I realized that there were <laughs> probably some, <laughs> some decisions would have been different. But, but I'm certain that you gained a lot from the experience. Absolutely, absolutely. As, as we all do for many things. Done again. Good, good. Well, being a funeral director might be a very difficult line of work, I have a feeling many think. It could also be very rewarding to help people in those emotional and meaningful times. What do you find to be the most rewarding in your line of work? Yeah, you're right, it, it, it can be very difficult, but it is extremely rewarding. Um, one of the best compliments or comments that we can get as a funeral director is that warm hug at the end of the service uh, family that says, hey, listen, this, we thought this was gonna be miserable, and it was, but you made it a lot easier and a lot better than, than we ever thought it could have been. Those are the kinds of things that, uh, that make what we do very meaningful mm -hmm. and very, very special to us. Well, I'm certain when, when it's finally over and everybody relaxes, sure. then yeah. yes. There's yeah. so many things going on and so many decisions to be made. So quickly. And a lot mm -hmm. going through their mind. We, we have a tendency to assume that they remember everything and know everything, and so we, we go out of our way to write everything down and just make sure that they're understanding, understand everything that's happening. Perfect, perfect. I'm, cer I'm certain that you have seen great, great change in funerals over the last 20 years. Let me just suggest some categories, and I'd like to have you just respond to each sure. one in, in terms of the changes you've seen. The locations where funeral services are being held. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it kind of ebbs and flows and it changes a little bit. Sometimes uh, we see where there's a lot of services in the funeral home, and then other times we see where they're at church an awful lot. Um, and I think going back to the 9-11 issues, um, we had a, a pendulum shift to doing services at a church more okay. often than not. Um, but there are also other venues where outside at a park, um, sometimes even at a person's residence or their farm or their um, facility where they were working, just mm -hmm. different options and different opportunities for families to, to really make it a meaningful celebration. Yes, yes, and that, that's the key. Yeah. The after-service gatherings, those can be quite individualized too. Very true, yeah, and in fact, 20 years ago, a lot of funeral homes didn't have the need for a reception facility or a meeting place after the service to, to greet friends. Now it's almost a must. Um, we have a reception facility right on in the funeral home and it's used probably eight out of ten times we have a service in the chapel we also use that facility so it's it's mm -hmm. definitely become a big part of of the celebration service mm -hmm. well everyone can gather and share their thoughts right yeah. right and yeah. even the the timing of that reception a lot of times we have the service followed by the reception and then go to the cemetery mm -hmm. maybe it makes for more of a private affair for the family uh, but it also gives the family the opportunity to visit with and reach out to and be able to be greeted by others that maybe couldn't stay if they went to the cemetery first. Mm -hmm. So there's a, mm -hmm. some scheduling issues. And the there. order of things really has yeah. changed over the years. It's not... Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, the order changes. There are certain components of the service and, and of the day, of the mm -hmm. day of the event, um, and they can literally happen in whatever order that the family chooses. Mm -hmm. And that, that's nice with yeah. people living all across the country that sure, need to come back. Sure. The obituary announcements, how have those changed over the years? Yeah, on one hand, they're getting longer and uh -huh, longer. They are. And at the same time, they're getting maybe shorter and just more of the, the factual information about the service. I think because of social media, uh, mm -hmm. people's Facebook and, and Twitter and whatnot, they can share the information and uh, get the word out, um, much like a newspaper used to um, and still does, but, but not as much as it used to be uh, done. Mm -hmm. In some smaller towns, they would have... Um, uh, window signs or, or posters in the window to announce services, really? and radio ads to announce services for a weekly paper or some okay. of those kinds of things in small towns. So yeah, it's changed a lot uh, over the years. It has, it has. And I like the fact that you can actually send your condolences online now. Yes, yeah, again, every, every funeral home has a website, every, every business has a website, and so a lot of communication is done that way, whether it's with your customers and clients or with the general public about the things that you're scheduling and services you're arranging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Printed programs during the service. It's rare that you go to a service without 
a, a program yes. now. Yes, it, again, it's almost a must. And okay. in, in all honesty, it's it's almost easier for us when they are just because it gives us something to do with the family guests that are coming in and hand them a folder and everybody wants one. That's uh, right. Sometimes they want two or three, which That's is fine. Right. And they want to be able to share and mail to family members that couldn't be in attendance uh, that they would like to send to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're also being more customized. Uh, it used to be uh, there was a, a standard picture of a farm scene or a cross or praying hands or a mountain scene. Now we do a lot of individual customization with um, meaningful memento pictures of mm -hmm. the individual, of their hobbies, their interests, their family, which is obviously a big part of their life normally. Um, and the family gets full proof of all of those kinds of things and, and they get the opportunity to, to really make it meaningful and special. And we talk about how that's the keepsake that the family is giving to their friends. That's exactly and right. Their gifts, yeah. Yes, yes, I love anything to make it more personal. Sure, I think is, is the beauty of it. The use of pallbearers. Uh huh. Yeah. Again, with cremation is probably becoming a little bit more uh, part of uh, of our society as far as method of disposition. Um, so pallbearers are obviously those that that help us uh, assist in carrying the casket and moving mm -hmm. from from one place to another. Um, when there's not a casket or when the casket is a, a rental casket or cremation is in some way, shape or form involved, we don't have pallbearers. So a lot of times they're listed as honorary pallbearers where they're mm -hmm. kind of in name only, they're the recognition of a special friendship or relationship to the individual over a, a career, a lifetime, a lifespan. Mm -hmm. And it is an honor to be a pallbearer. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Funeral processions, how have those changed? Um, as Lincoln grows, they're a little bit more dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, they're a little trickier sometimes to get through some stoplights and yes. uh, some of the intersections. Um, for the most part, I think we're, people are respectful of the procession and we try to put uh, some attention grabbing lights and flags on the flags uh, to get the traffic's attention so that they see us coming and they know it's a, it's a brief delay, two to three minutes by the time we get 10 or 12 or 18 cars through a procession. Um, so for the most part, um, they're, they're trickier because of the population, but I think we're still get the respect from the community. Yes, and, and I've noticed, it used to be people would actually pull over and stop. That rarely happens yeah. that I notice anymore, right. but I always slow down right. for yeah. sure. You oftentimes see people slow down. Occasionally you'll see someone pull over and stop. Um, sometimes, not for the whole procession, but sometimes at least until the, the hearse gets by, right. and then you'll see them resume. Um, but I think that's probably a good thing just because it, they might run the risk of getting rear-ended if yeah. they stop and the cars behind them don't. And exactly. Especially if it's a longer procession, then they might be sitting there it's for a more than issue. two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely safety. Technology can help in funeral planning. Mm -hmm. How does it, that help? It, it can help definitely, and it does most of the time when it works. And there's always those, <laughs> those occasions where technology doesn't... Uh, doesn't help us, but there's a lot of different things we can do as far as video tributes. Um, I, I mentioned the, the customization, the personalization of the, the, the service folders and programs. Okay. Uh, and there's also, uh, in the last few years, we've developed different programs where we can make the casket selection, the urn selection can all be done uh, through a computer program that shows them not full size, but large size images of the casket or the urn or the vault and even different um, register book collections uh -huh, and uh -huh, service folder uh -huh. samples. Yeah. So it has made an impact. It ha definitely has and, yeah. and we can show families a number of different options without having to get up and move around and go to a different yes, room or a different just, location. Yes, it's the comfort factor yeah, then. Absolutely, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Convenience and just make it easy for them. Our job is to make the next few days for them as easy as that can be. Yes. Knowing full well that it's very difficult. Yes, that's yeah. right, that's right. Services for veterans, what mm -hmm. is included and in, have you seen changes there? Um, probably the only change I can think of recently or in the last several years is a, a new national cemetery close by here in Omaha, uh, just okay. up the road. So that's a big change. We used to be the nearest national cemetery was probably in Leavenworth, Kansas, or maybe out even in Maxwell, Nebraska. Oh, we wow. would do those trips. Um, as far as the military rights, every veteran is eligible for uh, the flag folding and presentation, the okay. playing of taps and then the firing of the 21-gun salute, honoring mm -hmm. the veteran in their service. Which is so meaningful. Oh, and it's very moving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I've heard it and seen it dozens and dozens mm -hmm. of times, mm -hmm. and it's still moving. Now, you did mention that there is a technology available for the bugler if you cannot find a bugler yes. to play taps. Yeah, the, uh, the different um, local VFW and Legion clubs have um, a horn, essentially, with a, a recording device inside that, that plays taps by the push of a button uh, and the recording, as I understand it, is a recording of taps played at Memorial Day oh. uh, at uh, 
Arlington National Cemetery on Memorial Day. Uh -huh. And that's uh, sometimes what they do. Live bugler obviously is, is better, um, but sometimes mm -hmm. schedules mm -hmm. permit well, what they you, are. You, you want to include that for sure. Absolutely. At all costs. Absolutely. <laughs> what would you recommend, Dean, is the most important items everyone should be thinking about ahead of time to help their own family? Yeah, I think it's just making sure that your wishes are known. Make okay. a few notes about what kind of service, what type of service, um, you know, if you, what kind of flowers, those kinds of things. And if there are pallbearers or honorary pallbearers, the people that you want to help share and tell your life story, whether that's the minister from the church or people doing a eulogy um, or just whatever, whatever personal items are important to you, mm -hmm. just make sure that your wishes are known. It is an act of love, I think, for your family to have yeah. something written down and yeah. then let them know where that is. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure somebody knows where it is. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it saves hours of yeah. detective work by Absolutely, the family sometimes. Yeah, because we have to ask an awful lot of questions and gather a lot of information. Sure. And so sure. if, if that's already prepared and provided, yeah. it makes it easier for the family. So at then time. at the time of death, what documents are needed right away? Um, it's just information that we need to complete our documentation. So okay. information from the birth certificate. Uh, we don't actually need it as long as the information can be provided. I see. But sometimes a mother's maiden name oftentimes is forgotten. Yes. Or a grandparent's maiden name. Sometimes we forget that. And so that information is on the birth certificate. So that would be a good one to have yeah, close by. Other things would be that you would need for the estate closing and those kinds of things with the attorneys. But again, most of those kinds of things are after the service and the arrangements. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a certain amount of time pass from the death to the funeral and then to some of the follow-up information. I see. So is there aftercare help provided? Yeah, there is actually. We have an aftercare program and we just call it Stepping Stones and oh. the intent is to take one step at a time. Even though the services have ended and our service uh, to you has concluded, we can still be of service in yes. taking care of things like use of death certificates, uh, life insurance, title transfers, those kinds of things where mm -hmm. um, you need to provide a, a legal proof of death. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this aftercare program that helps families do that. Um, again, one step well, at a time, one day important. at a time. Yeah, yeah equally yeah. important. Prearrangement, what does that entail? Prearrangement is multifaceted. Um, question because the, the pre-arranging is again starts off with sharing of information um, what kind of services and the biographical information that we need for the death certificate also maybe some information for the newspaper notice okay. um, would also be information about what type of service you would like to have um, music and video and all those things mm -hmm. in addition to that sometimes it's the funding of that funeral arrangement so you okay. can lock in and guarantee some prices of what it is today that aren't paid until later, mm -hmm. um, but you're not responsible for some of those differences. So, so. it helps with the budgetary sure. process. It, it for sure, it sure can. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's everybody has a different opinion about that, and, and some people mm -hmm. love it, and some people say, "No, I'll just do it later," and, mm -hmm. and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Again, the main sure. thing is sharing of the information and making your wishes known. Okay, all right. I guess overall, I've just noticed that funerals are more celebratory. Yes, and it's all about the individual, which I absolutely love. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's. I'm glad to hear you say that because we can almost, as a, as a funeral home, funeral industry, we can almost put a check mark that says great mission accomplished wow. that's our goal we want to yes. be celebrating the individual uh, and as we we talk and train new funeral directors and new employees that um, this might be our third funeral today or the seventh one this week or the twelfth one this month mm -hmm. it's still the first and only one that this family is going to do for this individual how true how true very well said Dean you've helped countless numbers of families deal with loved ones in their final services what personally do you feel makes for a good goodbye? Mm -hmm. I, my personal opinion is a huge celebration. Okay. You know, and whether that's the, the candy that the person loved, the food that oh. they loved, the, the, the TV shows that they loved, um, you know, the, the scripture passages that they loved, the different things that made this person who they were, who they are, to each and every one of us um, is, is what makes a meaningful celebration. Just for everybody to be together and yeah, be with that individual absolutely. one more time. Yeah, yeah. Dean, thank you so much for absolutely. being with us today and providing this compassionate hand. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Thank you for joining us and always remember, it's never too late to live and learn.